Hey folks! Recently, we revealed 90 Days in Unreal Engine 5, a collection of real-time environments made with mega scans, Sketchfab assets, and Unreal Marketplace products. The 90 Days project kicked off with just three core artists and a simple concept. Make something beautiful and inspiring, keep it real-time, and if possible, build each environment in just three days. Check out the results of the self-imposed challenge on Quixel's YouTube channel, then read up more on the Quixel blog. We've continued exploring Unreal Engine 5 features, and now we're diving into rigging and animation. In our latest talk, Puppeteering, Recording Animations in UE5, we demonstrate how to puppeteer an adorable dragon with a player controller or VR controller by leveraging Control Rig and the new IK Rig feature. Watch the video on the Unreal Engine YouTube channel. Pull up a chair and check out these beautiful new high-res twin motion assets available for use in all your Unreal Engine projects. Stage your scenes with photoreal tables and chairs, get your game on with a high-tech collection, jam out some mad riffs, and then bring it all together with posed characters. Download them all via the Unreal Marketplace. Coachella has been making headlines for over 20 years, but this year, the organizers wanted to deliver a surprise for the millions of fans watching at home on YouTube. That's how the psychedelic augmented reality performance from Flume came to be. Go backstage via the Unreal Engine feed to learn how they might kickstart a new AR revolution with a single set, ushering in a new era where sometimes the best seat is right at home. Bouncing over to our community spotlights from Honest Demon, their public alpha for The Last Citadel is coming soon. The roguelike third-person shooter invites you to embark on an expedition to uncover artifacts from The Citadel. Face challenges and deadly encounters as you make your way through, exploring alone or with friends. Wishlist The Last Citadel on Steam. The next wonderful scene was created by Mohamed Hadiri. Based on a lovely concept by Matthew Limousine, they aimed to build a stylized scene and explored a lot of foliage techniques, water shaders, and more. Pop over to their forum post to give them your feedback. And last up, Drastic Games released their rhythm-based looter shooter Soundfall on Nintendo Switch. Venture into a dungeon crawl to collect all the loot, timing your actions to the music while you're at it. Play in a campaign mode, free play hundreds of songs, or add your own music. Dance over to soundfallgame.com to learn more. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I am your host, Tina, and today with me, we have some very, very incredible guests, a whole slew of specialists on this topic that I am personally so excited to learn more about. I can't tell you, the little snips, snippets that I've been able to see so far have been some of the coolest tech I've ever seen in my life. So I'm really excited to get into the show today. But to start us off, I'm gonna hand us over to Grace Yen, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about what's going on um, and we'll kick it off from there. Awesome, thank you so much, Tina. I'm so excited to be here. Um, for a lot of this community, this is the first time I've actually properly introduced myself. Uh, so nice to meet you. Um, I'm Grace Yen, I'm a senior product manager on the Unreal Engine team and audio is one of the areas that I have the pleasure to work on. Um, a little bit about me and my background. I've been working in games for over 17 years now. Um, I started off as a software engineer at Electronic Arts, and I really specialized in areas around building game modes, online experiences, and kind of overall user experiences. Um, some of the titles I had the privilege to work on include things like FIFA, NBA Live, um, NHL, for those of you who aren't in Canada, that's ice hockey, um, Need for Speed if you like racing, and a few other titles. Um, and while I was at EA, I was fortunate enough to get a chance to try different things and transition my career. So eventually I went on to lead teams of engineers working on Frostbite, which is EA's internal game engine. Um, and there we were working a lot of key features and workflows that helped power studios such as BioWare, who released games like Mass Effect, as well as DICE, who um, has released games including Battlefront, Battlefield, and tons more. 
Um, I also dabbled a little bit in analytics. Um, and so, you know, my curiosity in that area was really around looking at how are people using tools we were building to create content and how do we optimize for that in a way that we could really capture everyone's experience and make that better. Um, so about a year ago, uh, I joined the UE um, product team as a product manager. And I really started off at Epic Games looking after Unreal Foundation and DevTools. Um, so this is my chance to plug some of the other things I work with. Um, but my foundation team works a lot with low-level systems, so things around loading performance, cooking, memory management. Um, if you like threading, we have our task systems that we just released in 5.0, so check that out. Um, there's a lot of really cool things we're working on that I can't talk about yet that deal with dev iteration and making things faster, but I promise that's coming soon. Um, but there's some stuff I can talk about that's in the works that you're going to see soon, like virtual assets. So if there's anyone on this stream who works with lots of people, really big projects, and you find yourself spending a lot of time sinking down, um, you know, from source control every day, virtual assets is going to make it so much faster for you because you're going to sink down a lot less to get started every day. So look out for that. Um, on the dev tool side, I also want to plug a few things we're working on. Um, you might uh, already be familiar with and use Unreal Game Sync. That's one of the areas I help product manage. Um, and if you're into memory and profiling and that kind of stuff, we also have this awesome tool called Insights. So definitely check that out too. Um, so how I got involved with audio, I guess, is a pretty funny story. Um, Aaron, who's on the call here, about four months ago, we crossed paths and uh, he casually asked me, hey, do you want to join also as a product manager for audio? And <laughs> I'm pretty frank and straightforward. And um, so I never try to oversell myself. And I said, hey, um, the last thing I did is uh, in audio was play like a 2D sound in a game menu I was building. Do you think I'm qualified for this job? <laughs> and uh, he pretty much without hesitation said, yeah, perfect. You're hired. <laughs> so that's how I joined the audio space. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because it looks like it doesn't make any sense on the surface. But I, the more that I work with Aaron and the more that I've seen what we've been able to build together here, um, I think, you know, this was by design. It was like part of Aaron's master plan. Um, Aaron is such a visionary in this space. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's super plugged into the community and has built an amazing team around him who's really pushed this tech forward. Like when I look at the momentum of what we're delivering, release over release, and then I see all the people creating with it, um, it kind of boggles the mind how much is being done by this one team. Um, and bringing someone like me into the space, you know, I am kind of a new user, fresh perspective. Like literally I played a UI sound and that's all I've ever done. Um, that's been such an amazing collab that we have going on together because um, part of UE Audio and what we want to do is we want to make this tech accessible to anyone who wants to create really great sounds for their projects. It's not about like allowing the audio experts, the people that have been deep in this craft do cool things. We want to make sure that everyone has an experience and that when they come into it, they're not overwhelmed. It's a really you know, natural fit for them. They feel like they can be creative. Um, and I'm kind of the perfect person to do that. I have a pretty simpleton kind of mindset. Um, and so I'm usually the first one in meetings calling out like- He's very hey, humble too. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm the first one calling out in a meeting like, hey, that thing has too many nodes or pins and wires coming out of it. I'll ask all the questions that people kind of on the stream today who are kind of new to the space are probably wondering, but maybe weren't ready to ask yet. So I'm kind of that voice for the community. I'm there to make sure that our products are really easy to use and accessible and that we're always designing with simplicity in mind. Like it's going to be powerful, but more importantly, we're really taking that approach of making sure it's simple so that people come into that ecosystem easily. Um, and so, you know, product manager, I guess I've said that a few times now, that's my title. But what does a product manager do? Some of you might have never worked with one before. And I guess the best way I could describe it is that I am kind of that user voice. I'm channeling all of your experiences, what you love about our tools, features that you wish you had or things that you find difficult. And it's my job to help bring that back to the dev team in a way that they can action on it and kind of improve upon releases. Um, I think one of the really exciting parts of what I get to do is I get to hang out where you are, Discord, Twitter, all the cool places, um, and see all the demos and cool things you're posting. And I bring that back to the team and get them excited about these things you're creating. Um, and together, Aaron and I, um, we're working together to chart kind of the future vision for where we're heading in this space and planning out the next few releases. Um, so we're really looking forward to being able to share that more broadly with the community to get your feedback and make sure that we're heading in the right direction together. Um, so thanks so much for listening to my long intro. Um, with that, I'll pass it off to Aaron, who really needs no intro, but I'll let him introduce <laughs> himself anyway. 
So I don't know, if, Grace, if you remember, uh, actually, the first time we met was you had just given a company, internal company presentation that uh, on, on your foundation work. And I think everybody was like, whoa, like, <laughs> we were all like really blown away with how polished your presentation was and how excited. And I was like, if we're not funding and making sure that that initiative has got all the resource, like it, it was completely convincing. And I pinged you, I think in Slack, and I was like, hey, Grace, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Aaron. I really enjoyed your presentation. And then you said, hey, would you like to get on a call and chat? You just like, and I said, well, well sure. <laughs> and so then we just casually chatted and, and talked about stuff. And then later when it came possible through lots of convincing internally that I, that audio needs a product manager, uh, your boss was like, hey, uh, do you think, you know, maybe Grace would be someone? I, I, absolutely, because <laughs> I'd already met you. And I was, you know, so that's how that's kind of how it happened. And I'd been agitating internally for a product manager because I think for audio, we have a particular in, in our in specifically in UE audio, we have a particularly challenging space and the team is growing fast and we're getting a lot of resources and I, I have strengths and I have weaknesses <laughs> uh, and uh, I definitely can uh, uh, see and I've and, and I'm proven right that a product manager would absolutely help uh, our efforts. So I really appreciate your work, Grace. So um, let's talk about Project Acoustics. Uh, this is one of the initiatives uh, that we are working on, and uh, from a product vision, is that we want to make sure that Unreal Engine audio is recognized as a great place for collaborations with third parties. Um, that my team and and myself are open for for adjustments and collaborate. We're very flexible on our approach. That's one of the stories we want to tell in, in this uh, in this chat is like some, so how, how did this develop? Where where did we compromise? Where did we collaborate? Where are we thinking about taking some of this stuff? And sort of how it works. They have a Slack channel at internal to Epic that we just chat. We have weekly syncs on how this could go. And uh, it's just been a great example of the types of things that we're trying to push uh, in terms of the Unreal Audio Engine. Um, I would say uh, the biggest thing recently, as you might know, uh, is in release 5.0, we have MetaSounds. And MetaSounds is a big focus of the team, but there's a lot of other stuff that we have in our engine. Um, we have a full featured submix graph, uh, APIs around spatialization. Um, you know, we have our own spatialization, but plugins and third parties can easily expand on that. And this is a story for that. There's a really cool thing that we worked on with them that we'll talk about later. So. Um, our, uh, so I'll set this up, and uh, uh, I, I guess I haven't actually introduced myself uh, briefly. <laughs> that was a, we have like a, a thing, and I, I just jumped right in. So my background, just if you don't know who I am or, my, or where I came from, um, so I have a uh, background in physics. So doing something with Project Acoustics was really exciting for me. He's like, I, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is stuff I didn't think we could do in real time, you know. And then uh, uh, I taught high school physics for a while. <laughs> I also taught high school calculus, and my first uh, game job is actually uh, writing procedural music in Spore. So that was that was a crazy story in its own right. I talked about it elsewhere, but feel free to ping me on social media if you want another version. Um, and then uh, I, I went to graduate school for sort of media arts, kind of you know creative coding. And then I went back to games as a sound designer, and then uh, I was on uh, Dead Space Two as a sound designer. And then from that experience, I was like, I just like I, I was like a technical sound designer that just went way too deep down the rabbit hole of code. And I'm still there. I'm still going. The the the, end, the bottom is endless. And uh, I'm just a programmer now. Um, and uh, I started at Epic seven years ago. And I was uh, the only programmer working on audio for a couple of years. I think I was the first programmer they hired specifically for audio. They had been doing audio features and code from sort of generalist programmers before me. And uh, since then, I've built up the team and really have uh, sort of built up a lot of momentum around audio tech. And I'm uh, sort of proud of the progress we've made in this collaboration with uh, Project Acoustics and Microsoft is just a manifestation of that effort. And I'm really excited to finally be able to share this with you all. Um, something I'm also really pleased to be able to share with the community here is that Aaron has been recently promoted uh, yeah, for, <laughs> to director of Unreal Audio, um, Engine Audio. So I, yeah, I forgot. Um, Literally just a couple of weeks ago, I, find, I have been promoted up to director level, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> this really is amazing because I think um, not only does it really speak to the fact that Aaron's doing some really incredible work and we're really reflecting his title with the kind of contribution he's having and that Epic kind of really recognizes our team members seriously. Um, but I think more importantly, this even shows 
it's a reflection of how serious Epic Games and Unreal Audio is considered in this whole ecosystem. The fact that we have someone who is so senior in the UB audio space, um, it really shows that career growth. Like we have a lot of momentum yeah. behind us. Our team is growing. So if anyone is out there and interested in this space, absolutely, there's a lot of career growth and opportunity yeah. happening. And I think- it's some open Aaron, still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, so Aaron really, so congratulations, Aaron, but I want to share that with the community who's been following him. Thank you very much. So um, I guess uh, we can pass it off to Microsoft. Uh, I think our order that we're going to do for intros was Noel, Kyle, and Nakun. So Noel, if you want to uh, introduce yourself. Oh, was that yes, the order? absolutely. Actually, it was quite close. I thought maybe what I could do is I could just jump in before our Microsoft oh, sure. friends introduce themselves. I could maybe just set a little bit of context and motivation. Oh, sure. Sorry. That'll be a great tie-in just so we can kind of set the stage for everyone who might be yeah. new to audio joining, kind of like me wondering, what am I going to get into here today? Um, but I guess, you know, the, the context here really is when we think about things like 3D spaces or experiences, a lot of times we think through um, things like what a space visually looks like. So you're thinking about, you know, how does the light reflect off of different things in the environment? Does it look good? And that's something that I think we, we see a lot of um, discussion around. But often we find, you know, as we know in audio, sometimes we're kind of like tagged at the end or an afterthought in some ways. And, you know, there's a lot of times where there isn't a lot of discussion happening about visualizing what a space might actually sound like. That's known as oralizing. Um, so games, of course, has been aware of the importance of making sounds that are, you know, affected by the environment they're in through occlusion materials. Um, but those efforts, I would say, on the most part, have been kind of limited to quite simple approaches. Um, for example, if you have a scene you're working on um, and you have, let's say, snow in it, you might set something up in Unreal where you have, let's say, an audio volume. You set a reverb setting on it um, and make it sound as close as you can. But let's say if you want to go back to that same scene, that environment, and now add maybe concrete and have a mix of concrete and snow there, um, you would have to go back to that same volume that you set up and kind of do a little bit of a guess and test and try to tune that until it sounds right again. Um, Aaron tells me the technical name for that is a smoke and mirrors is the technical term we use there. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's technical, that but that's what we, all, we always <laughs> refer to. It. Oh, that's the smoke and mirrors approach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, Just but kind of fake it. <laughs> yeah, you kind of fake it. And it kind of works on the most part. It kind of sounds pretty good. Um, I mean, another approach you could take, not that it's necessarily recommended, but um, you could maybe do ray casts at runtime. But of course, that's a lot of cost on the compute side, um, quite intensive there. Um, so what's really exciting about what we're going to talk about here with Project Acoustics is that you could really start to drive some of these systems with like real physics. Um, like it's you're really looking at the acoustical modeling of the environment you've built. Um, and that allows you to create experiences that not only kind of sound more accurate to the space, but it's also really great for workflows that you don't have to go back and find all the volumes that you sprinkled everywhere every time materials change. You're really able to um, kind of like set things up, I think, appropriately at once. Um, and then when you're ready to go through and do those iteration loops that uh, it's kind of happening behind the scenes with some pipelines that are happening here. Um, so for anyone who's a lighter um, in this call, you're familiar with lighting. I think the best way to think about this would be it's like a light bake, except you're doing it for sound. So it models all of the complexities of um, sound in your scene through a pipeline that kind of does that heavy lifting for you. Um, so this demo we're about to see is going to, it represents, I think, a deep partnership that we've had with Microsoft to bring their plugin to Unreal and to enable more creators to create really great sound experiences, even if you don't have a PhD or an extensive background in the space, which I know some of us here do. <laughs> so our project acoustics for Unreal Audio plugin has been released on the UE marketplace since May 17th. It's free for downloading, so absolutely download it after the stream today. Uh, without further delay, I'm gonna pass it off to our Microsoft friends to properly introduce themselves and jump right into the demo. I guess I'm up. Um, so my name is Noel Cross, and I am super excited to be here. It's been a long time of collaborating with um, folks on my Epic side, and uh, it's been a sweet uh, collaboration, honestly. Uh, been a lot of excitement as as uh, we built towards this uh, moment, and uh, and we're really excited to see people downloading this uh, plugin now. But I'll talk about myself a little bit. I'm uh, principal engineering lead uh, for Project Acoustics. Um, I'll go into my background a little bit, a little bit into the Wayback Machine. In the early 90s, I joined Microsoft as an intern from the University of Oregon, uh, Go Ducks. Um, 
And this was a time when there wasn't any audio or video in Windows. And the mission was to add audio and video to Windows. Um, you know, this was a time of like dip switches on sound cards and, um, and you know, luckily those days are over. And, uh, you know, Windows has <laughs> audio and video support for a long time now. And uh, so in the mid 90s, I worked on DirectX, DirectSound, DirectSound 3D. And this is when video games were starting to migrate to the PC. Um, and, you know, really advanced ones were, were starting to show up on the PC. Spatial sound was one of those things that I started working on as, as part of DirectSound 3D. And at the time, I, I was, you know, excited about it, but also there's some encumbrances to it, meaning like you got to be in a sweet spot in between these speakers uh, on either side of your monitor. And it was really easy to fall out of that sweet spot and the illusion was lost. Also, the compute needs back then were, were pretty high. And so um, it, it, was, it was challenging to get uh, spatial sound working in the mid 90s. And really, I would say most people abandoned that, uh, abandoned it over time um, until a resurgence um, that, that we're seeing now. Um, in in 2000s, I, I worked as the audio dev manager for Windows Vista, Windows 7, uh, when we introduced things like perhaps volume control, um, class drivers for USB and Bluetooth and, and uh, high definition audio, as well as a whole new audio engine. So I kind of led uh, the team through that evolution uh, on the Windows platform. And then uh, I was kind of getting ready to do something different. I worked on uh, in, in 2010, switched over to this uh, concept of WinRT, um, the Windows runtime, and uh, that mission was to update all the Win32 APIs in, in Windows to really kind of match the .NET programming design. Um, and that was, I, I thought it was pretty successful, but, um, you know, I don't think it really caught on very, very uh, much. Um, but, you know, I, I moved on from that and then uh, decided to join a project that I had no idea what it was going to be. It was like the super secret project, probably the most secret project that, at Microsoft that I've ever even heard of. Um, it turned out to be HoloLens. Um, it was before we even knew what it was called. It was this big giant helmet on your head and it was super uncomfortable. I was like, no way this thing's going to ship. But uh, I, was, I was really excited to be on that journey. One of the most important things about the HoloLens was, you know, you wanted immersive experiences and spatial sound was going to be that thing that gave you that full 360 degree view of your space, your virtual space. And so I was like, oh no, spatial audio again. Um, but then when I tried it out on, you know, early prototypes of the HoloLens, the, the thing about uh, that, that made it amazing was a, a truly highly accurate head tracking algorithm paired with a highly accurate spatial audio algorithm. And that really gave um, people a, a truly immersive experience. Um, people would you know, tell me like, I didn't even know the difference between a virtual sound and a real sound. Um, and, and that was really gratifying and it really piqued my interest in working in immersive audio space. And uh, that's when uh, collaboration started with, with me and Nakunj. Uh, in MSR to start this project called Project Acoustics. And that was really to bring these high fidelity immersive audio experiences to VR, because um, that's what I was working on, VR and AR. Um, and eventually, you know, this work kind of led us to AAA games and, uh, and, and AAA games led us to, be, to work with uh, Epic Games on this integration of Project Acoustics into the Unreal Engine. And that kind of brings me to today um, and, you know, we're super excited to be talking about this stuff and, and showing it off. Um, I think that's, that kind of covers me. Um, I'm not sure who's next. Is it Kyle? It's, it's me. All yeah. right. Oh. Hi, I'm Kyle. My intro is going to be a lot quicker. I am a software, software engineer on Knowles team. I joined Microsoft about nine years ago, right out of college from RIT, go Tigers. Um, since then, I've always been working on audio. I started um, on stuff like on the capture side of things, keyword spot and speaker ID. I worked on the original Hey Cortana detector pipeline for Windows and HoloLens. And then in 2018, I joined the render side of things on Knowles team. And in 2018 was right when Project Acoustics made its first public offering that was um, a Unity plugin. So I've been able to see it grow from that simple Unity plugin to now something that's being featured on uh, for UE5, so it's just really exciting to be here. Big leagues now. Yeah. 
Hey everyone, I'm I'm Nikunj Raghuvanshi. I'm the inventor of the stack and research lead on it. And I've been at it basically for most of my career. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it came from my grad school research and I've been at it for the longest time now. Like I joined Microsoft in 2009. So the whole time I've been just chasing this thing and you're basically seeing my dreams come true live. <laughs> and it's, it's been my tremendous luck, you know, through this whole process to have had awesome colleagues all along the way. Um, and like for, um, so let me do a little bit of a history predating project acoustics on this. And then uh, I'll also talk a bit about the tech. So tr project acoustics started with something called Triton in Microsoft research. And this, this was basically some papers we did. And through this whole time, I've been collaborating with my colleague and mentor, John Snyder, who's very well known in graphics as well. And he's been contributing for the same 13 years to this thing. And we had a paper and we started talking to the coalition who made years of the war. So this was John Morgan and his team. And, uh, and we started working on, okay, how do we take this research on this wave-based uh, pre-computed stuff and turn it into something that would actually be workable for a AAA game. And then we quickly realized we were off by factors of hundreds on CPU, RAM, this, that, everywhere. And we started the real work of doing research to bring it to the real world. And we spent like a four-year process um, working very closely together. I actually worked a lot with, with Jimmy Smith, who Aaron might know. He's on his team, yeah. team now. And we hired Jimmy. Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> so Jimmy, Jimmy took, took, did all the integration, you know, into the engine of this yep. new sort of nascent technology. We worked a lot. And in 2016, we proved it out. We shipped it in Gears 4. And that was the point at which we're like, okay, this is, that's Triton, right? That initial integration. But it was still sort of a lib, you know, some XCs flying around. It was internal tech. And it wasn't clear how you, how this goes from one game to many, right? And the, right around that time, 2017, uh, I had the luck of starting to working with Noel and his team. And Noel's covered some of the history from there. We shipped it on some of the HoloLens stuff. And released a plugin in 2018 for Unity and for mixed reality thinking initially, but got a lot of input from the gaming side of the world. And so we were sort of pulled towards that and uh, evolved this thing. Then we did Unreal and um, with middleware, and now we're here today. And the mission of Project Acoustics is really, I think Grace mentioned this, like span the range from an indie who just wants a drop in things like, okay, make good audio on this now. Let the environment react to the audio, click a button, do that, right? Spanning the range from that to like triple A's who might want to dig as deep they want into the tech and do something with it, right? So that, that's, that's what we're trying to do is to make acoustic propagation really a common technology throughout the industry that's easy to use and yet powerful. And so that brings us to this collaboration. I think that the ease of use with this, I think we've, we've made a big step with just having a direct integration into the engine and, and all the new APIs we worked on together to enable that. So that's, that's some of the history. And let me now talk a little bit about what, what it actually does. So as Grace mentioned, this is like light baking uh, at the high level because the idea is you ingest the geometry and the materials of the scene and model sound propagation directly from that instead of you know, laboriously drawing volumes and maintaining logic throughout the scene. But one great thing about like drawing volumes and doing things yourself is you have control, right? You know exactly what your intent is and you're able to express it. So the danger is if you automate it with physics, you lose that control. So one thing that's, that's, um, that's an axiom for us is you should not lose control. You should be able to either modify the acoustics we're rendering, basically, which is the audio designer, to, to control it, to even override it, but always to have the sound designer in the driver's seat and just reduce, first of all, reduce their headaches of maintaining all this manual stuff and give them more finer grained acoustics to work with than volumes can ever get you. So that's, that's the high level. Um, now let's get into some of the internals, what we do and what makes it different. And Kyle, if you could share your screen to, then I can, I can talk to it. So 
what we do is we actually model how sound waves propagate in real life, uh, which is, and a big portion of that is what's called diffraction. So if you can see in the simulation at the bottom, these sound waves are like ripples in a pond rather than being rays of light, right? That's a crucial difference for audio. And this mirrors real life, by the way. Our senses are very clever. So we have, we have two long range senses, vision and audio, right? Vision is very high precision in direction, right? It's, it's arc seconds of resolution, but audio is much lower resolution. But the thing is audio is first of all 360 and you can hear around corners, right? So any audio propagation system, those are the salient things it's looking for because you can hear these effects. You can hear sound getting occluded around a corner, sounds coming through doorways. Like think about how we navigate in real life. You hear a sound coming through a door, and you're like, okay, that's the general direction I should walk into to get to whatever's making the sound. Then you proceed in that direction and then maybe you start seeing the thing and then you're like, ah, there it is, right? That's how we navigate in real life and that's mirrored in games. So my point is that this is accuracy not for its own sake, but because this sort of diffraction modeling, modeling all these waves propagating through the scene, give you these really important and immersive cues in a game world. And that's, that's where we start from, right? So in this sense, it's not the same as light baking because we're doing wave propagation modeling, which is essentially different. Uh, we're not using rays that would be just completely obstructed by something and cast sharp shadows, which doesn't sound good for, for audio. And this is also partly the reason we bake because this is very compute intensive. So, what you're seeing here is one of the simulations we do. We do thousands of these, and these are 3D volumes. We're looking at a slice, right? So we need to do a bunch of these, and to control CPU costs, we just offload this to a baking step, right? So that's one of the reasons, like audio needs this detailed physics of wave physics, so we have to offload it to, make, to keep the CPU usage in check. Um, but we, over time, we're adding dynamic stuff on top. So baking means static scenes, but we're, we, for example, have a preview version of dynamic portals in this release. Uh, it's experimental, but we're sort of taking steps in that direction now. So just, um, we'll stop talking in a minute, I promise. So uh, the mechanics of this is uh, we lay out a bunch of what we call probes in the scene, which, is, which represent where the listener might go uh, as they play the game. And then from each probe, we do a volumetric simulation like the one you're seeing, right? So we have a bunch of these that can go in parallel when you compute them during the baking step. But then what we extract is what you would care about in audio, which is how loud was the sound at various points? How reverberant was it? How long did it reverb for? Was it a big hall or a small one? And you'll hear us use the term parameters many times. That's what we mean. Like all these are just parameters, occlusion, reverb, driven based on wherever the source and listener is dynamically. So that's, that's what we're up to. And I think that's from here, Kyle can take it away and show us some, some of this in action. All right, let's do a live demo. So you should be able to see my editor now. So. Uh, this is Lyra. Some of you may know it. Lyra is a learning resource created by Epic as a sample game to help users understand the frameworks of UE5. But for us, as um, people who work in project acoustics, this scene has been great because it's got big rooms and small rooms that are connected by corridors. It's just a great way to demonstrate lots of different acoustic effects. So we we're really excited when we learned about Lyra. And what I'm going to show you today is project acoustics baked into Lyra. So first, I'm going to do a live sizzle reel. I'll play Lyra, and you'll be able to hear acoustics. And then afterwards, I'll show you how we baked it. So, so real, real quick, I want to say Lyra um, is available for download. Um, it is a uh, some. It was a the new UE5 sample project, and it features meta sounds. So all the audio you're hearing is meta sounds, which is our new tech. And Kyle was able to to do this uh, sort of as a drop in. So um, just to pointing that out. Yep. Okay. And in addition, we do have a Lyra scene with acoustics baked into it as a sample that you can also download. Yes. So yeah, like Aaron was saying, we did the, the basics to get Project Acoustics uh, set up in here. We didn't do any design tweaks or anything. We just 
baked it and that was it. So this is what you're what you're going to hear is what it sounds like out of the box. Yeah, like a drop in. Yep. There were a couple of things we had to disable from the default scene, like they had some reverb volumes, which we disabled, and then they had some occlusion attenuation, which we disabled. So all, all the, of, the smoke and mirrors was disabled. <laughs> yeah. So all the reverb and occlusion you're going to hear is from Project Acoustics. So I'm going to play the scene and there's going to be some text on screen that um, shows acoustics enabled or disabled. So that shows you when it's enabled or disabled so you can hear the difference. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, I think that's good for now. So let's show you how we bake that. So our plugin is now live in the marketplace. So you download that plugin like you would any other code plugin and you load it into your scene. And when you do that, you will see a new mode show up. And this is our acoustics bake window. So in this window, there are four tabs and these tabs represent the four stages of the baking process. So stage one is objects this is where you're supposed to tag objects. And you wanna tag objects because we need to tell the acoustic, acoustic simulation which objects should be included in the simulation. You don't wanna include everything in the scene. You only want the stuff that's relevant to acoustics. So that's mostly the walls and floors. So uh, we need to tag two things. We need to tag geometry and navigation. So for geometry, you could manually select each object in the scene, but we have these bulk selection helpers for you. So we will select all the static meshes and that selects all the static meshes in the scene. So now they're selected, now you need to tag them. So we tag them as geometry. The next thing we need to tag is navigation. So navigation defines where the player can move in a level. And we wanna know that because we wanna target our acoustic simulation to those areas. So um, one way you can do that is by selecting all the floors but there's a better way to do that and that's using the nav mesh because the nav mesh already defines where the player can move in the level. And Lyra came with the nav mesh, there it is. So we'll use this helper to help us find the nav mesh. There it was selected. Now we tag this for navigation. So now we have objects tagged for geometry and navigation. So step one is done. Step two, materials. So out of all the meshes that you tagged in the first step, we pulled all the materials off of those meshes and we put them in this table. And what you, what you need to do here is assign a acoustic material to the, to the surface material. So here we all have all the surface materials and then here we have acoustic materials. So acoustic material defines how absorb, absorbent or reflective that material should sound in the simulation. So in this drop down, we have a bunch of examples of common materials. So stuff like tile glazed, this is gonna be really reflective. So the coefficient is closer to zero, but for something like fresh snow, that's more absorbent. So that's got a coefficient closer to one. When these are first loaded, we do a simple string comparison to check. So for instance, we matched uh, glass with glass. Um, and then you can do further assignments yourself. So for instance, in this scene, I know that all these white walls, they have a, uh, a material called surface. So I would go through and assign all these surface materials to be concrete because I know that these white surfaces were designed to look like concrete. 
So when I baked the scene, that's what I did. All right, that's it. Well, one more thing. Uh, so you can use all the presets or you can define your own custom one um, and set this value to whatever you want it to be. All right, third step. It's probe step. It's also called the pre-bake or you can also think of it as bake setup. So this is some computation that needs to be done locally on your computer before the final acoustic simulation. And the two things we compute in this step are the probes and the voxels. So I will kick this off and talk about that while it runs. It'll take about 15 seconds to compute, complete. So voxels, voxels will simplify the geometry. So this geometry, it's, it's, it's really detailed. It's our curves and stuff. That, that's going to be a lot of compute to um, doing a simulation on it as it is. So we're going we're gonna to blockify it. We're going to turn it into a bunch of blocks. So that simplifies it for the simulation and it makes it a lot easier to move that data around. And then the second thing, the probes, we will place probes in all the possible places that our player can go. So it's kind of like a nav mesh, but we use probes. And we will place these probes kind of intelligently throughout the scene. Uh, Nikunj, do you want to talk about the probe placement? Yes, semi-intelligently is how I'd put it. But what we try to do is if you have narrow hallways, right? So the place to start could be say uniform sampling, right? Place every two meters. But the danger with that is if you have a narrow tunnel like this tunnel right here, you might completely miss it. And if you don't have a probe in a certain area, then we'll essentially fail queries, which is to say we can't really compute the acoustics if the player was here. So that's what this adaptive layout tries to do is to find these narrow areas. It detects how narrow the area is and just increases resolution only there, uh, but keeps a sort of lower resolution everywhere else. And you sort of have these settings in our probe layout to control. If it's a big, very big open area, you could actually increase the spacing quite a lot without missing narrow areas. Yeah, so when this calculation completes, an actor is added to your scene. This is a temporary debug actor. And this actor is what displays uh, these boxes. So these blue boxes are the probes. And we can also sh see the voxels. So turn on the voxels and we can see how all the geometry is now represented by these big boxes. So that's it for the third step. So now we're ready to bake. So like Nikunj mentioned, the simulation step, it's a compute intensive step. Um, if you were to do it on your one PC, it would take a long time. So we normally farm this out to compute clusters. And because we're Microsoft, we use Azure, specifically Azure Batch. Azure Batch is a distributed task system in the cloud. And our plugin has built in integration with Azure Batch. So you, as the user of this plugin, you would need to set up your Azure Batch account in an Azure storage account. Our documentation uh, gives you instructions to help you with that. And then once that is entered, you can um, specify some information about the types of machines you want to use, the pools. So you can learn about these machines, but the difference is they have different CPU, different memory specs. And then you specify how many machines you want to be included in the simulation. Our recommendation is to set the number of nodes equal to the number of probes. So this acoustic simulation, it's easily parallelizable according to the number of probes. Each probe can run in its own independent simulation. And then at the end, we can combine them all into a single data file. So we will assign 509 nodes. And if we do that, we see that the total bake time is gonna come out to be a minute because each one of these probes com uh, completes really quickly. And we're gonna have 500 machines doing each job independently. But then the total compute cost, the total time altogether is nine hours. So this is also how you can uh, calculate how much it's going to cost you. So for instance, these F8s, I know that these F8s cost about 30 cents per hour. So the cost of this big job would be 30 cents times nine hours or about three bucks. You can also use the low priority nodes. These are cheaper, but you could be preempted in the middle of your job. Uh, low pry for F8 is like seven cents an hour. So that gives you a sense of the cost for these bakes. So once you fill in all this config stuff, you can submit the bake. And what this is gonna do, it's, it's going to send those probes and voxels to Azure. It will do the acoustic simulation and then it will return that final acoustics data file at the end. So all that is done automatically for you and that can run in the background. So it says one minute, but there's setup and teardown time. So this is 
this will really take like six minutes, but we will kick it off. So this job was submitted, so I can show you a little bit behind the scenes of what it would look like. So if we go to our Azure account, and if we look at jobs, and I refresh, yeah, we can see a new job here down at the bottom. So, so over here, we'll update with the status. It hasn't kicked in, but we can see this one was created just now from UE. So this is our the job that it just kicked off. Yeah, we can see this ID, it's um, 11.45, 11.45. So if I click on this, we can now see that around 500 machines have queued up with all those individual simulations. So we're not gonna wait for that. We already have some big files ready. When that big file is ready, it would be downloaded into your content folder. And it goes into content acoustics. So we have some um, older big files here. So this big file has all the acoustic parameters for the entire scene. So for any possible source listener pair in the scene, all you have to do is look that up in this data file. And just a reminder, this is all offline. So there's no Azure usage when you're playing the game. Just like a light bake, this is done offline so that at game time, it's just a really quick look up into this data file. All right, so now you have this acoustic data file. Let's add it to the scene. We are done with this window. So there's really three steps to get this working in the scene. Step one is to add an acoustic space actor into the scene. So all of our actors start with acoustics. I'll search for acoustics. Uh, so you would just normally drag this into the scene. I already have one in the scene. There it is. The location just doesn't matter. Just drag it in there. And then on the acoustic space actor, there's a spot to load that data file. So I have our demo version of the data file loaded. So that's step one. Step two, you need to enable the source data override plugin. So I think that's something we haven't talked about yet. Um, Aaron, do you want to mention quickly about the source data override interface that we created? You're muted. You're still muted. I just realized I was muted. <laughs> um, so I, by the way, we there we are getting flooded with questions from the community. So I've been half paying attention. Apologies, because I'm trying to sort these questions that are coming in in a way that we have a chance to answer. So keep them coming. There's a lot of great questions. And I'm really excited, by the way, about the community response to this. So I do want to talk about a little bit about uh, Unreal Engine plugin, plug our tech a little bit, and then sort of how this collaboration worked. So we, as you know, we've had, uh, you may not know, but we have had a uh, spatial audio API that uh, various plugins have implemented in the past already, like um, Oculus uh, Steam Audio, um, uh, the Sony's uh, spatialization technology, uh, Google Resonance. Um, so we have this sort of existing spatialization API. API. So when we started working with uh, pro a deep integration with Project Acoustics, we were thinking like, oh, we've got this API. Let's try to use that. And as we started down the path on this collaboration, it kind of worked. Uh, but there, but there, there was this sort of idea of maybe we could utilize as much of our tech as possible and just be drive our existing tech with acoustics in a uh, baked data. And then it, this sort of started going down this path of like really tiny additions here. Maybe we should add that, maybe we should add this and this and that. And uh, I was like, okay, I wanna make a new interface. So we'll call it a uh, propagation interface. And I was like, well, it's more than just propagation, it's this and that. And so we iterated on this. And at some point after enough sort of minor adjustments and I would call them like nickel and dime API things. I thought I had like a epiphany. I was like, you know what? I could just make an interface that gives all of the source data to a plugin. Just here you go, override whatever. This is, this is what we have. This is the API we use. This is all of our internal data and just give it to a, a plugin and they can override properties as they see fit as they go. And so that's where the idea of a source data override interface came from. Um, I, I don't know if you, you plan, um, I have the code ready to show if you wanted to, to if I wanted to screen share it, but Kyle, if you yeah, want sure. to show it, um, just to show you, it's really simple interface and it was, and it's extremely powerful. <laughs> it's sort of like a, like, here's the, you, you know, the kitchen sink, uh, approach. So basically you, if you're a programmer, if you're not just, you know, go, I don't know, have a drink, uh, the, uh, interface gives you an initialization callback with some basic, you know, plug-in initializations, then you get a callback when a sound source is initialized. 
and there's a this sort of like classic way of passing in using uh you know uh 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 interfaces this if you actually click on uh that base you'll see it's literally nothing this is just like literally a handle uh yeah so it's literally nothing in there and what that does is allows plugins to be able to imp implement that and then it's like a if you're a programmer it's like a, a void star just like user data whatever you want whatever you want to pass it's like a way for you to just kind of give yourself your own settings um for your plugin and then you get a call back when a source is released and the idea is just the the sort of handle internally to the audio engine. And then the real key idea here is that you get this callback uh, at the right stage in our rendering pipeline. So you get this, obviously, source ID, the information about the listener, which is the closest listener for split screen. And then if you go into that F wave instance pointer, <laughs> this is the raw, just show the, this is the, this is what we use. This is everything, all the data, everything that you might need. It's, uh, it's pretty here you go <laughs> yep. and you can basically do what you want um to any parameter that's possible it's pretty complicated but it's basically full access to all of our feature set and at that point it's like there's nothing else for me to give you this is everything <laughs> uh and then uh, the the project acoustics plugin which is the first client of this basically just uses their acoustics data to drive whatever uh source parameter that they want and they can just pick and choose which thing and the they can completely and totally modify how that source is going to uh, render. It, it's a pretty sweet fit to our architecture as well, because yeah. internally we structure it, always structure it that way. It makes it much more flexible to, yeah. to integrate to just for an example is maybe Kyle will cover this, but when you hear a sound around a portal, we don't really fundamentally care how you spatialize it. What Project Acoustics is trying oh, to say is out the sound should be me. heard from that direction and that sort of unwrapped distance through scene yeah. distance, right? So we're just trying to reposition the sound there. And this makes it super easy for us to say, okay, that's the position, substitute this other position that, that came from the propagation and we're done. And we don't have to even think about yeah. what spatialization technique somebody has chosen. Also to point out that this is, this is the um, data that feeds the lower level audio renderer before it gets to the audio renderer. So, um, it's it is basically a high level parametric controller. Um, we have meta sounds, uh, which some of the people have asked, might as well approach it. Someone's like, oh, "How does this work with meta sounds?" So right now, Project Acoustics doesn't have a, like a deep integration with meta sounds. Um, that's absolutely what our our collaboration will continue on this. You know, I can easily imagine a scenario where uh, similar to this on this uh, source data override that a meta sound playing in this context will be able to have uh, uh, interface. We call them interfaces, but you think of it as like a data interface, maybe analogous to a Niagara data interface for Niagara particles, where the meta sound could implement an interface that gives you access to acoustical properties directly in your meta sound graph so that you can go cr even crazier with taking this sort of baked data and then figuring out whatever you could possibly want to do and it could be non non acoustical or like non physical. It could be based off of this acoustic data that is in the scene. I want to do some kind of crazy procedural synthetic transformation, like a hallucination. Maybe you're doing a drug game. I don't know. Point is, is you could do anything with this acoustic data. Yeah. And maybe but, in the meta sound graph, we'll have, you'll have direct access to all that data to drive your audio. One, your one scenario audio. that that excites me is like giving game AI characters hearing. Yeah. Not literally give them signals, but just tell them, okay, that's where you heard it from, right? That's the direction you should run towards. It would sort of drive much more organic behaviors rather than them having some omniscient view yeah. of the whole nav mesh and then constraining them to say, no, 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 you're too godlike. Yeah. It's cripple you a little bit. Uh, instead of that, just having them have audio inputs would be very interesting. Or, or um, or also I mean, so, so, so AI is yeah. the ability to hear around the corner, right? Yeah. Yep. Right. Which yeah. Is you, you don't want to block that just because a ray, you know, if you did a ray trace, like we don't see you, but we hear you around that. Yeah. Corner. I would say that that type of thing would be done higher up, like in game code. Um, but it the, the point being is that acoustic data in general can be driven in all kinds of ways that are beyond just acoustic simulation. Um, for audio, I would like to say that. Uh, so, so we're it, what you saw on the scene is driving our our like we have a convolution reverb, and some other basic effects that are just ours, and their thing drives it. 
but you can totally imagine if you're out there doing R and D and acoustics, like you could use project acoustics as the sort of Baker analyzer, and then you could get that data and then run some kind of physical modeling simulation within MetaSound. So you could actually, so this idea of like them kind of decoupling their own synthesis rendering from the analysis side is a brilliant solution for all kinds of stuff. And if you are deep into physical modeling, which is a keyword, by the way, uh, in audio, <laughs> uh, this could be an avenue for you to do that experimentation within MetaSounds and with this sort of acoustic analysis technology. So I'm really excited about the direction and the collaboration in this regard. Yeah, all right. So back on the demo, yeah, we were talking about the three things you need to do to get acoustics uh, set up in your space. So first, set up that acoustic space actor. Second, you need to make sure that the source data override plugin is selected. So like we were saying, Project Acoustics implements this new source data override interface. So you go into your platform settings for window and just with the other guys like Spatializer and Reverb, there's now a Dropbox for the source data override. So make sure Project Acoustics Ooh. is selected there. One thing to, to highlight here, because this is a really cool point uh, and awesome. So if you see, I just reminded looking at it. So we are using Resonance, Google Resonance in Lyra, which is an, another plugin <laughs> using our interface. So Project Acoustics is completely compatible with existing spatialization technologies, including Dolby Atmos, or what you know, whatever kind of spatialized interface that you could imagine, Project Acoustics will work right alongside it, which is pretty kind of a, a cool thing. Yeah, yeah, right. So Project Acoustics doesn't do the spatialization; we pass it off to whoever is selected. So make sure you have something selected here. Right now, we're just using Residence because that's built in. So that's step two. Step three is now you need to opt in all your sound sources that you want to use acoustics. So by default, all the sounds are opted out. So to opt op them in, you need to go to your attenuation objects. Hey, Kyle, so, can I can yeah. I interrupt one more time? So because you said make sure you implement, you don't have to inter, in, implement an interface. We have spatialization <laughs> in Unreal Audio. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. if you want to do a third party binaural spatialization, just pointing it out. That's for third party plugins, but we have you don't have to do that to run UE Audio. Just want to correct that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. OK, so for Lyra, they have a bunch of all their sound attenuation stored here. So we'll start with pistol because that's a good starter sound. And on the pistol, this is the pistol sound attenuation object. Uh, just like you expect, you see all the different types of attenuation, spatialization, reverb. Now at the bottom, there's a new one for source data override. So to opt in, you just need to check this box, enable source data override. And then here is another thing. So we have per source settings, like project specific per source settings that you can add to your attenuation objects that give you more control over the sound. So I created one of those. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But that's the final step to get audio working, to get acoustics set up in your scene. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is to verify that acoustics are working, because that's a common um, problem we hear. Are, are acoustics working? So. Ideally, you turn it on and it's, you can hear the acoustics, but sometimes it's not obvious when acoustics are working, so I'll show you some tips. So tip number one is on the acoustic space actor. So let me turn off these voxels. On the acoustic space actor, there is a toggle to turn on and off acoustics right here, acoustics enabled. So that's what I was doing in the demo before. I have a key press that toggles this on and off. So that's a really good way to see. You can turn it on and off to see if you hear any difference. And then step two to see if acoustics are working is um, probes and voxels. So if we play the scene, um, we can see the probes and voxels that come from the acoustics data file that we loaded into the scene. So we saw the voxels before, but those were pre-baked voxels. Now we can see the real voxels that come from that data file. So if I open up the scene, I can go to my acoustic space actor and turn on voxels and probes. So these voxels and probes are coming directly from that ACE file that came from the simulation. So this, this is um, a good way to verify that everything is lined up because it's possible for the acoustics data be, to become unaligned from the scene data. All right, and then the third trick is if we go to this per source settings, so let's follow the chain again. So go to the attenuation object, go to these per source settings. There's this final one, show acoustic parameters. This one's really useful. So turn this one on and this will give you debug um, 
debug information displayed on the screen for each of the active sources. That's that text showing up and it shows up where the sound is. So if we, if we keep watching, we'll see it show up on all the other um, player sounds. All right, so next on the demo list, yeah, we can talk more about those per source settings. So if we go back, here they are. So the acoustics data, um, the acoustics data file will give you recommended or the default acoustic parameters, but say you wanna change those, say you wanna make the sound or the space sound more reverberant. We give you design control to do that. So on these per source settings, we have these design parameters. And these design param parameters allow you to do stuff like increase the occlusion or increase the wetness to make it sound more reverberant. Decay time will make the reverb longer or shorter, or you can make a sound sound more, more outdoors. And then distance warp, this is a, I won't get into this one, this one's a little tricky. But yeah, these give you, um, so you can adjust these on one source or a group of sources, however you want. So when you make these changes, what's important to emphasize, you don't have to do a rebake. Correct. Which is huge um, in terms no. of iteration. Yeah. Th these, there were some questions people had, if I want to iterate on some settings, like is it going to be like a six minute turnaround? Yeah. You, you need to rebake only if you change materials or move geometry around yep. the scene. Yep. Um, yeah, this is exactly like I was saying earlier that our philosophy of doing automation with physics and then giving you control, this is it, right? Yeah. So you could say, for example, speech and dialogue needs to come through clearly for certain kinds of speech. Then you just take the wetness adjustment down and keep it super dry, right? Yeah. At a global level um, yeah. for, for all speech. And so you can group sounds, you know, reason in that way about footsteps, for example, you might want to exaggerate to convey the space you're in. So this is basically how this sort of works with the vocabulary of sound designers. Yep, so those were per source design controls, but then there's also global. So the global ones are on the acoustic space actor again. So on acoustic space, we have the same design controls. So these will automatically apply to every source in the scene. All right. That's all I had for the editor demo. So now I will switch back to code um, and talk a little bit about how we use that source data override interface. So we talked about it a little bit, but let me go through my portion. So this acoustics source data override class, this is our implementation of that interface. Here is that really powerful method that Aaron talked about that gives us complete control over the sound object. So I'll show you how, which properties we modified in this wave instance to achieve our acoustic effects. So let me talk about those acoustic effects. So there's kind of three main acoustic effects that we achieve in this Unreal Marketplace plugin, and that is portaling, occlusion, and reverb. So we have this pictogram that we always use. So portaling is the change in direction of, change in arrival direction of a sound source based on geometry. So in this picture, there's two sound sources in a room and the realistic scenario is that you hear the sound through the doorway and not through the wall. That's portaling. Occlusion is how the geometry changes the perceived loudness of a sound. So when sounds bounce around and have to go around geometry, the loudness decreases. And then reverberance, reverb deals with um, how loud reverb should sound, uh, the duration of the reverb, and also the ratio of the dry sound to the wet sound. So if the user is close to a sound, there should be more dry sound. And if the user is far away, then there should be more wet sound. So those are the three effects that we achieve with this plugin. And I will show you how we achieve those effects with this wave instance um, override. So we'll start with portaling or spatialization. So like we were saying, our plugin doesn't do spatialization, but we, improve it, we augment it. And we do that by changing the arrival direction. So to change the arrival direction, we take our acoustic params, params such as the arrival direction and the distance to the source, we call it the path length in meters. And using these, these two things, we can come up with a new arrival direction. So in, instead of the sound coming through the wall, the sound is gonna come through the doorway. And all we have to do is override the location property of the wave instance. 
and that's it. That new location will then be sent on to whichever spatializer you have selected. Second one is occlusion, this block here. We do the same thing here. We take a couple, couple of our acoustic parameters. So for instance, we take dry loudness and wet loudness, and we do some math, we convert it to amplitude, and then all we do is set the occlusion attenuation directly on the wave instance. So if, if you remember from the attenuation presets, you can change occlusion attenuation by um, setting stuff here, but instead we can set that directly through the wave instance. And for this one, this one does not work with other occlusion. So for spatialization, we can help spatialization of other plugins, but if there's another occlusion plugin you wanna use, then you have to either use that one or this one. So you can turn off occlusion for our plugin or turn it off for theirs. Then the final one is reverb. Reverb is a bit trickier. It's got its own method. And let me go back to the editor to show you something. So there's one more place. Um, I know it's a lot of places. So project settings for project acoustics down here. So here you can see what we call our reverb bus structure. So we have a set of six submixes in which we store unreal convolution reverbs. And inside these convolution reverbs, we have impulse responses of increase in length. So we have two banks, indoor and outdoor. Each one of these has a short, medium, and long. So ideally, the impulse responses are ordered um, in an increase in order. So for instance, our short one is half a second, medium is 1.5, and long is three seconds. So using these convolution reverbs and our um, the reverb parameters from our acoustics bake file, we can mix our audio in the right proportions into these reverbs, and, and that's how we achieve reverb of specific duration and loudness. This is actually uh, something that's a fun story to tell. So <clears throat> first of all, that is all the submixes. That was uh, Kyle's um, project acoustics seems like, hey, this is, this is how we want to do reverb. Um, there's multiple approaches one, one could take to it. It's really great to use convolution reverb, but convolution is a little bit kind of on the expensive side. So they demoed this to me and I was like, oh, that's that's great. What a clever solution. And uh, but then I was like, you know that all of those submixes are running all the time. <laughs> They're like, oh, we're only we're only sending it to a couple at once. So so they were thinking that the submix is just automatically disabled. And I was like, that actually is on our feature map. <laughs> feature map. So I implemented it for them because there's like no way that you could just be running nine convolution reverbs uh, at all the time. So uh, so I actually implemented for 5.0 for Project Acoustics this uh, auto disablement feature. So if no sounds are sending to a submix, uh, then they'll just turn off. So it won't cost anything if you're not playing audio on that uh, convolution and, reverb, which is intuitive. And I'll add that you, we're not, it doesn't require convolutions. You could use yeah. any parametric reverb in here. And, yeah. and also it might look a little funny if I interpolate this way. So I'll comment on that quickly. Um, with, with our system, every sound source can have a different reverberation because it can be a sound source could be in a narrow hallway, you're hearing yep. it. Another sound source simultaneously could be in a big hall. Yep. And we are getting all these sound sources yep. with all these different settings. And we want a reverberator that can do all of them. Now, if we instantiate yes. reverbs for each one, your CPU dies. So yep. that's, that's the trick here is every source can say, this is my wetness and I want say 2.5 seconds. And we say, okay, so you're a blend of 1.5 and three more weight on three. Right, that's that's the entire trick, and that's why it, it is this way. So, so probably knowing this, if you watch Kyle's demo, if you want to do it again with that in mind, because it to me as an audio programmer, I like immediately recognize like, oh my gosh, that is awesome. Source based, in the general term is source based reverb versus listener based reverb. Yep. Smoke and mirrors approach is almost always just listener based. It's like where am I standing? That's what the audio for the sources go th goes through where I'm sitting, which is a classic pro. I mean, almost every game has that. It, but the result, though, if you if I'm in a narrow hallway and somebody shoots a gun out in a big hall, like, you know, space, it that gun will sound as if it's in a narrow hallway because the listener's standing in the narrow hallway. And that is just sort of something that game audio has had to suffer with, even at Dice Grace, like they, they <laughs> Battlefield won all the awards, but it's like all their games have this problem. Everyone has this problem. And the, and there's a lot of approaches coming out to do this sort of source-based reverb that are exciting. 
Um, but this is a great solution based on acoustics. And when you watch his demo again, you'll and pay attention, like an AI bot will be running in a big hallway and you'll hear it really reverberant whilst I'm walking in a hallway and it's nice and, and tight. And that is a really exciting, subtle, but very exciting direction for game audio. Uh, I'm very excited about. Yeah. So just one final thing, uh, how we, where we set these reverbs on that wave instance. So there's this object called sound submix sends. So first on the six reverb buses, we uh, add our gains and then we store these in the wave instance on this property called sound submix sends, just an, an array of submixes. Uh, Aaron, what, what's the original purpose of this? Uh, say it again. What's the original um, use of oh, these? Oh, are you talking about in wave instances? So yeah. each sound can send, uh, basically, when you play a sound, you have a bass submix, which is this, this sort of idea of like what is, but that's optional. You can say this sound doesn't play in a bass submix, and you can have a list of submix sends. So a sound can say, hey, I want a portion of my audio to go to this submix, a portion to go to this submix, a portion to go to this, and you can, it's up to you how you want to do it. And all of those, the bass and the, the send list are all enca encapsulated in the sound submix sends. The zeroth index, I think, is treated as the base. Oh, never mind. I, I'm looking at the code now. Base sound mix is separated. Sound sound mix okay. is base sound mix. <laughs> In the, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> yeah, okay. so that's what it is. It sounds can are arbitrarily route to whatever sub mixes, which is what you guys are utilizing here. That's because you're building this sort of blend. That's really powerful. You're taking advantage of this sort of natural ability for audio to get routed to arbitrary sub mixes. Yep. Which is cool. Yeah, and that's already reverb. So that was the end of my demo. Um, anything else you guys wanted to cover? Well, we have a lot of questions we have coming through. We're endless... just trying to tackle it as a team here. Um... They're coming in like a flood. I've got, okay, so. <laughs> Which is great, Let... but yeah, you wanna go first, Aaron? Well, I'll just set it up and Grace, maybe you and I can just sort of field it up and we'll chat. Um, but I wanna set it mm -hmm. up like I am kind of, I have been on a couple of these live streams. I have never seen the volume. I don't know, Tina, what your take mm -hmm. is on it, but I'm like, oh my God. So we're not going to be able to get so to all these. <laughs> uh, so I broke it up into different categories. So, so I'll pitch up the categories maybe. And I try. I started highlighting, but I can't keep up. So we've kind of covered up, covered some of it already. But the general sort of categories are sort of the realism of the sound. So, uh, Grace brought this up as a category. Uh, so it's like, you know, it, I think the demo, you can judge for yourself how real it sounds. Um, but uh, there is something to be said about it's still actually smoke and mirrors in many cases. Um, then there's a whole bunch of physics questions and complexity questions and dealing with like, does it account for this? Does it account for that? Does it, you know, RT60s and, you know, speed of sound and all this stuff. So uh, Nikunj and y'all have access to this. So if you spot any, look, we can answer some of them. Then there's a lot of questions around dynamics. And this is something I wanted to highlight because um, Grace and I, before we, came up we had our own questions and i was like we got to talk about dynamic support so dynamics are things like so we do this big stuff it's very static and in the world of graphics that was cool you know like oh like baked lighting and then but i want my scene to change i want to add destruction i want things to move i want players to be able to build scenes and so in graphics you have this sort of bake lighting thing which is like old school <laughs> and then you have dynamic lighting and then in ue5 obviously we've got lumen which is all about like yep. hardcore amazing dynamic lighting so in that, so graphics is already like, yeah, baked lighting is so old school. And we're like, hey, guys, we got baked audio. It's awesome. And you're like, all the graphics people are like, whatever. <laughs> They've already moved on. <laughs> so the question is, how can we bring Project Acoustics and the dynamics? So, uh, so we'll, we'll talk that. But I do want to, I'm just going to categorize them. Um, and then the next set of questions, we got a whole bunch around the baking process, Azure, how does the cloud stuff work? Can I do a local? How can I do this kind of a thing? Which which is another thing that Grace and I wanted to talk about. And then a whole bunch of kind of procedural, I, I would put them as like sort of bread and butter type support questions. We don't, they're a little bit boring, but maybe we can touch on some of them. Like what platforms does this work? How do I get it for this? How do I get access to this? Does this work for that kind of a thing? So um, so that's the general categories and there's a billion in each of them. So. Um, maybe we can start with, uh, let's talk about, um, let's see, what's a good one? Actually, Grace, what do you think? What should we start with in terms of categorical question space? And we can kind of just have a Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I'm coming at this as a new user. There's people on the yeah. stream who probably are, you know, doing this as a hobby. They're wondering, can I 
use this? Should I use this? Um, yeah. What are our thoughts? You know, not a professional game design, yeah. <laughs> game sound designer by any means, but this looks really cool. Do you recommend that we just take this and start? Yeah, so I guess maybe to, to uh, put the, there's a couple questions on this area. We can kind of summarize mm -hmm. it as, is this just for triple A's? Is, can indies mm -hmm. use it? Do I have to have this crazy Azure thing that's set up? Like, there's a lot of people really excited about it, but maybe are feeling overwhelmed that this is just for pro AAA or you know, or or, or that kind of a thing. Can we can we talk about that? Uh, yeah, Project Acoustics friends. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. As as I said, I think indies are totally like we 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 want everybody to use this, and. Uh, many AAAs actually, they're like for them, the all the plugin stuff is actually API documentation. And they're like, okay, where's the core of this thing? Throw away the rest. We, we have your docs, fine, go away and we'll just use this, right? So the, this making this, this plugin and making all these workflows is to sort of embrace the whole community, right? It's, it, is, it is an express intent here. Yep. Like if you um, have, maybe another way to say is like, if you have AAA programming resources, you're probably going to like really tailor it to your game in a way that is probably even beyond what we're thinking about. So a lot of what we're doing in this collaboration is in fact to make it more turnkey, yes. more uh, plug and play for, for the smaller dev. Yeah, exactly. And like, and have a sort of a deep well of you can go deeper and deeper with time and use it more and more as a power tool. But initially, when you use it, it shouldn't be like, oh, my God, uh, which is where this was in sort of 2016 when I said the history of it. It's like, yeah, Gears of War can use it, but can you? And now, hopefully, the answer is yes. Right? That's where we're hoping we are. Um, and I quickly want to say, when you mentioned Azure, um, I, people might have got, got it at the bottom of the bakes thing, but we have a local bake option, right? Now, to be sure, it's sort of a serial bake on one machine. And it, it, it will take a bunch of time, but at least for somebody saying, okay, how will this sound in my scene? It will probably take overnight, maybe a bit more, but you can basically try this out that way without even thinking about uh, where's my cluster compute and stuff like that, right? So and one of the things that, that we talked about earlier in our collaboration was opening up the this uh, interface to support other cloud solutions. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it, I, it's not in the interface now, but what, where are we on on that sort of thinking? In terms of like, uh, I mean, I, I know we're not going. You're, you're not going to implement anything outside of Azure, but supporting the idea. If you are, let's say, AAA yeah. or an enterprising indie person who maybe maybe you have. So we're doing local bakes, but maybe I'm I'm going to put together a cluster, my own like home yep. cluster. Maybe I got a bunch of old Xbox 360s sitting around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like maybe or, I just want to use example. some old. For example, I don't know why I would pick that out of nowhere. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there's there's you, a history you, on that one. But you let, know like, much there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, as far as baking is concerned, like certainly Azure is you know, our preference just because it's easier for us to implement that. Um, but we're not against using other cloud providers. That would be something that would be more our, our AAA title uh, vendors or studios that would be more interested in that most likely. And, and we encourage people to go through our source licensing program in order to get access to the source code so they can build for the platforms that they want to, but also if they want to do custom tooling for baking, then they would go get the source code and, and put it into their customized cluster. In our experience with many of the studios is they have their own uh, pipeline for light baking. And so they crib off that. Yep. And, and yep. so for us to provide a, you know, a standardized solution there, um, it would probably not be relevant to most studios because they've already stood up their own custom thing. So uh, we leave that as an exercise for, for studios to, to figure out how to integrate into their, to their own workflow. Um, but again, you know, we're not going to prevent you from going to AWS or some other cloud provider if you, if you want to do that. Grace, this could be an opportunity to plug some of your other initiatives, maybe. <laughs> it's like future collaboration <laughs> opportunities here. Oh, I'm worried we're going to run out of time, but I yeah. think definitely we can in a future <laughs> stream. But maybe just building on the topic, like there's a lot of interest around. Um, I think that analogy of light, like baking really struck a chord with the audience here because there's a lot of questions about like how much faster or slower is it than a traditional light bake? Um, how big are the file size assets? I think it'd be really neat for us to touch on that, maybe even in the context of what was done here in Lyra. Like I know Kyle, you showed 
um, the estimate where if you did a local bake, it would be like nine hours, but are you running like a supercharged thread ripper? Do you have, you know, a computer from five years ago? It'd be kind of maybe neat to see if we could add some more kind of dimension to yeah. that. I think I'll say off, off the top of my head, first thing is two things make it worse than light baking in terms of compute. One is we have to do a wave simulation, but the other one is with light baking, you have, you put the sun somewhere and bake. Right. So the source is sort of fixed and it's a starter with yeah. audio. You need dynamic sounds. Otherwise, it's a non starter. So to take the you have like one sound it, sitting out in the world, yeah, playing exactly. sound. <laughs> and you have fun with it. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> so with, with audio, it's like the lighting analogy would be you want global illumination with a dynamic point light. Right. Yeah. That's the starting point for audio. Yeah. Right. And then you have to do that with waves. So yeah, yeah. That, so I want to, I want to yeah. emphasize that, like, cause I've, I've had like arguments with graphics people about this. Cause they're like, well, audio is so simple. And I'm like, you guys, <laughs> light is like simulated as a point source. And you, and although light is a wave, there isn't, you don't do wave simulation when you do light baking. And it you, works you okay. It, yeah. And it, and it great. You just sort yeah. of, they're like things that bounce around and you count bounces and they, you know, you just do a bunch of like instantaneous tracing. <laughs> You're not doing like literal wave simulation, which you could also, I, I, I have characterized it as fluid simulation, but it's really just wave simulation. But fluid. fluid simulation somehow gets people to go like, oh, wow, because they know like fluids moving and, and I, you know, I think it feels the, complicated. <laughs> the point here is that after all that approximation, ray tracing is so darn hard to fit it yes. in the compute envelopes with a GPU. Like that's yes. the amazing thing about Lumen, right? But that's after like decades of research with a specialized hardware yeah. when you can use a reapproximation and you can assume some things to start with. So I yeah. look at it as this is sort of a minimum viable thing that works within like practical CPU constraint yeah. that games really have. Yeah. And hopefully as people use this and this sort of technology is used more, it can start some arguments yeah. within studios to allocate more compute resources and sort of start creaking up that door for more compute and, you know, maybe even some GPU a person can read, yes. but uh, that or, would be, that's what yeah. would enable really dynamic stuff. I but mean, the history, know. the history of games and hardware manufacturers and all that kind of stuff, uh, it's a feedback loop, right? So the more games want something, the more hardware people will go, okay, actually, we, we need to go to the back of the drawing board to support this and sort of, but you need to start somewhere. <laughs> And you get yes. people, you know, you got to get people interested in even the idea yeah. of doing it and that it's powerful and it'll, it'll build out from there. And we totally understand, right, that gaming goes where it goes. If the game requires lots of dynamic stuff, it just does, right? Yeah. And what does an audio designer do in that case? And we, we totally understand that. And we're just trying to sort of bring these two ends as close as possible together, yep. right? So that now we're sort of the way we're thinking these days coming to dynamics is okay, have a static skeleton, but dynamics on top of it, right? Again, retracing the steps lighting took pretty much. Yes. You had fully baked, like quake style, old yep. style, it's just baked. And then it moves towards bake some of it, but then you can have some dynamic shadows from yes, dynamic lights. Exactly. But now you, you'll pay a CPU cost for them. Yep. So there's a sort of also an education process built into it that, okay, everybody understands yep. light baking. Yep. Now we can have some dynamic stuff, but it comes with CPU hits and you have to control shadow map resolutions yep. and this and that, yep. and you have to become specialists yep. in that, right? This right now is pretty turnkey, but as we go into that, sort of that's the process. Like our dynamic yep. opening stuff is exactly like that. It comes with a CPU price on it. Yep. Uh, we're still working through the corner cases. As I said, it's experimental, but it's an illustration of how we're thinking about this. The, the other thing to point out is that um, you and I, we've been chatting about some stuff. We can't probably talk about it too much, but taking inspiration, for example, from Lumen and its solutions for global illumination and cost amortization and some of those kinds of things to sort of make the magical dynamicism of Lumen possible in the, what does that look like in the world of audio? Can we do something similar with amortized acoustical simulation costs and things like that so that these kind of, we can take advantage of, like, maybe we don't need to immediately react on a, you know, acoustical scene change. Maybe there's some slow yeah. <laughs> amortized cost calculation that we progressivism. can do. Kind of yeah, like we, yeah. We, we want to do progressive rendering sort of or uh, yeah. um, interactive, but yep. not real time. Uh, that's another thrust, like area of thrust we have currently. We call it incremental baking internally, but that's that yep. idea that 
if I have a giant scene, I move one wall, yep. right? Don't rebake every probe, which is what we actually yes. do today, right? It's and, and our intermediate solution is you can chunk up your bakes with what we call include volumes. So you can create groups of probes essentially that you say each one has its own data file and then you yep. can orchestrate. So I think some of the questions were around level streaming as well. Yep. Um, so, so that's the answer. That's a way, for example, if you're already tiling up your scene in a certain way, you can just attach and include volume to each and it doesn't need to be tailored. It can just be a big giant box covering a grid cell and you yep. can have data files attached to each, which you could even wrap up into your level data, right? And just send it through your streamer uh, and it does its thing, right? So that, that would be our recommended path to deal with it today. But where we're headed is you change something and then it, it sort of incrementally is updating yep. those proofs that were dirtied up by the process of changing. And not having to redo it all. Like it's like a, yes. a localized incremental bake versus throw out the old bake. <laughs> so, they, right. so the idea is like you do the scene and then maybe you have a survival game or let's say a battle royale type game where people can build things. I don't know. I've never heard of that game. But <laughs> let's say you put something down in that scene and you want your acoustical propagation modeling yeah, to update, yeah. that's the idea, you know, is that you could you could do a bake and it may not immediately start doing acoustical simulation, but you kind of go, oh, if this scene changed, go do this and then incrementally like. So yeah, there, there's a that's the path I think that the yep. graded path towards more dynamism is yep. probably starting with a little bit of dynamic portals and stuff, dynamic obstructions yep. maybe, and simultaneously making the editor experience more and more interactive and progressive. Exactly. So we cover it with that. It's vague, but I think we've we like ten percent covered a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> so apologize. We're gonna like read it. We literally got like six hundred questions. Uh, is there another um, Grace? If there's another, you know, topic to tee up from your opinion? Yeah, actually. Well, I mean, one of the questions that we had was around um, like how real to the sounds, like the quality of the sounds. Could someone use this to build a space? and then expect what that would sound like in real world if they were to build, you know, in the physical world. How close is it? We are getting closer. So uh, is there a future where a sound designer can have an analogous career to like an acoustician? Yep. Like, you know, where you go in and you're like, mm, this space is going to sound terrible. Let's like, and then talk to design <laughs> and sort of say, D you know, designers, you really need to move this wall here because it'll yeah. sound much better. Is I, that, are we in that future? We're going in that future? <laughs> we, we are, hopefully, that's what we're pushing for, actually, yeah. to, to sort of bring that level of accuracy because internally, there's no inherent limitation to that if you're willing to, you know, progressively yeah. pay the RAM, RAM requirements that more fine-grained data requires. So right. at, at Epic, there's a big push um, out to, to broaden our tech beyond games and um, it, uh, architectural visualization is a huge yep. push for a lot of Epic. Absolutely. So this particular technology is probably very exciting for that domain. I know a lot of ArcViz projects don't think about audio, but in my opinion, <laughs> maybe I'm biased, <laughs> I feel yeah. like uh, the sound of a space can be a really compelling way to, vis to it's like oralize the space and visualize yeah. the space. We, what would this look like, you know, and sound like? Uh, we, so we have a collaboration like with, with actual, with a company, architectural consultants actually, yeah. where they're running validations of, of our tool. And a lot of, some of it is not here, it's active R&D for us. Yeah. But we're actually trying to figure out that question against measurements and stuff. How close are we? And today the answer is not far, um, yeah. but we're not there yet. But uh, as we, I think, so the good thing here is um, it, it's not a bifurcation in terms of functionality, right? Yeah. Gamers and con acoustic consultants want more or less the same stuff. Yeah. Maybe the priority order a little bit different in some cases, but they want yeah. the same stuff. So that's the great news for us, right? I would say they have... often often want the same stuff, but gamers sometimes want to. So they're actually this is related. Uh, maybe we can key it up. But mm -hmm. uh, there's a question of like, okay, we do this all this cool acoustic simulation, but then I want to be able to, as a sound designer, like override and control yes. for some boutique yes, yes. moment, and I want to be able to adjust it. And that's one oh, of the absolutely. things I'm really excited about Project Acoustic. Yes, is yes. That it's, so it's open. when I said they want the same stuff, I meant <laughs> for an acoustic consultant, they're done. And yeah. for an audio designer, they'll start, right? Yeah, exactly. They, they have <laughs> a reliable, starting point. <laughs> our whole philosophy has always been reliable and robust starting point. Yeah. Right? yeah. You're not fighting corner cases all yes. your whole day, but yeah. you have something you flip on and maybe I'm over promising every tech. <laughs> <laughs> 
every tech has its bugs, but that's that's our goal. That's our aspiration. Yeah. Is you robustly can expect uh, that this today already does a reasonable baseline. What you'd yeah. expect, it won't surprise you. And as time goes by, we can actually claim accuracy as well in, in the sense, sense of measurement based accuracy. And, yeah. and for these large open world scenes, like you don't want to design for every single nook and cranny of that that yeah. scene, right? And so you want to concentrate your sound design effort on you know those real emotional the key points, places and moments. key places, and you know this helps to automate and all all that um, you know very trivial or very uh, menial work. It gets gets automated essentially, yep. and then you can focus your energy on you know that that glory scene. Uh, my, my particular thing, though, the angle, I mean, I think you answered it, but there's a, a little sliver I want to emphasize is artistic license. Like yep. sound, sound designers will want to use the acoustical modeling, but then be able to make, you know, you know, maybe they're having a mental breakdown or something. And all of a sudden, all of the reverb washes out or whatever. You don't want to be like constrained to always be realistic, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. You probably don't want me as your game designer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> us neither but we're yeah, all we're we're not game yeah, we're, we're, we're all tech people uh, but we listen and um, yeah. some of some of our learning started early like we've been learning from day one because this the genesis of this was in the hands of sound designers uh, like john Tennant on gears of war he was like okay this is what we need and this is the sort of controls we need so it's always been in our dna so uh, follow when we oh, talk sorry, about like, architectural acoustics you know one of the things that um, we aspire to do, but is not quite there yet. Is is the the notion of transmission? So, you know, through a medium um, where you're going to get some sound uh, traveling through, like say walls or something like that. That that's not something that we model at this time, but you know, it's something that we're thinking about, especially as we start to collaborate with architectural acoustics firms mm -hmm. that are that are looking for that quality in the simulation. Yeah, hmm. and there's other things we're doing like discrete echoes. Now that's a case of that's required both by gaming and by. Well, we're not doing that yet, but we're researching. Yes, yes, that that's what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, did I misspeak? Okay, yeah, we're researching that, and uh, in a game that progress, might be. Yeah. Was that? And making good progress on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're getting close. So, like getting echoes from an outdoor, like slapback echoes, right, in a game yeah. from some distant geometry. That's pretty cool. Or the reverb in a forest. Yep. And an acoustical consultant would care about, I put a reflector above the stage. Did I get a volume boost? Yep. Do I hear lots of combing on the music now? Where do I place it? But essentially it's the same problem. You just so, want to capture those effects from the wave sim. This is where you and I, uh, by you, I mean your team uh, in the, and I, I mean my team, um, we could uh, collaborate on some tech because we have the ability to, to do essentially 3D submixing using something called audio buses and source buses mm -hmm. and they're dynamic. Uh, so you could in C++ spawn them on the fly. And so if you're in an acoustic model, you say like, oh, this is bouncing up over there. And just like you're dynamically sounding uh -huh. portions of sounds to a submix, you could play a 3D submix off of any particular point in right. space and dynamically route audio to that. So you could do a, a sort of bounce back simulation right. on Makes the fly sense. and drive that sort of thing right. from your acoustic simulation. And again, abstract out the spatializer again, right? It could go through exactly. the spatializer. Yeah. Exactly. Makes a lot this, of but, this is how it happens in real time, by the way. We have our meetings. We're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> if we totally do use this, you could totally yeah, do actually, it that way. You know? <laughs> forget we're on a live stream for a second. Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, gotta be careful I feel what like, you say. <laughs> I feel like I just hopped into the middle of uh, one of the brainstorming <laughs> sessions right now. <laughs> it happens all the time. I can't, you can't help it. You're just like, oh, dude, this is going to totally work this way. This happens a lot. Uh, but I, one of the things I wanted to say is uh, uh, there is a lot of questions about physics here about like, okay. you know, and I don't know if you want to pick any, you know, like, do we model, you know, time delay, speed of sound? One of, one of the things that uh, I po pointed out right away hearing your demos when you got it was this issue of source splitting through propagation modeling. So like, you're like mm -hmm. in a hallway. <laughs> I'm standing here. Yes. The sound can yes, go yes. that way or that way. Yeah. And you, right now it only does one. Um, so there are some kind of interesting corner case limitations that pop up. Yeah, if you want to just I'm, pick a, a couple things to talk about in that case. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find the physics questions actually here. But I yeah. have them uh, questions about complexity physics or techniques group here. Oh, I see. It's in that group. Yeah. Does acoustic okay. support conduction of audio from distant sources, for example? Conduction. <laughs> There's like 50 questions. Here. Yeah. We, okay. so it's crazy we, overwhelming. Mm, yeah, 
Uh, Does acoustics automatically account for speed of sound and delaying playback of distance? Or could, are the coefficient values in the materials the same as real life absorption coefficients? Uh, you know, the frequencies used for absorption coefficient, or the they different across frequencies. Yeah, so, yeah, sort are, of general acoustics questions. I think a lot of people, yeah, they're great. I, maybe we after because there's a forum here. Maybe we, Nakunj, you can send them links to your papers and or references for yeah, and I, this I kind could, of a thing. So people interested in the physics can go, go to, deep on it. <laughs> we're going to find them, but we could do like short answers very quickly yeah. for some of these. So uh, what, I, I, let's do one. Nanite. How does nanite influence the bakes? Uh, I think we have wow. a good answer for that. Oh, nanite influencing like, yeah, we just need to ingest the geometry. But then yeah. once we, we voxelize, we're done. Like Kyle exactly. said, we, we have an audio geometry representation at that point on which we'll run the sims. Yeah. So, and so, so the voxelation process is kind of like a down reser. It's not like you have to worry about the crazy yeah, micro exactly. geometry. Yeah. Of, yeah. And yeah. that's one thing if you use ray tracing systems is you have to worry about triangle counts. So I think that yes. was a question too. Your triangle counts don't matter. And that's one of the nice things we think about this yeah. is you can just throw your whole thing at us and you don't have to worry about um, little stuff changing things too much. Uh, if you have, for example, a non-watertight mesh, this is my favorite example, and you have a small hole in that mesh, well, it will sound in real life if you dug a small hole yeah. through a wall, up yeah. to the voxel resolution, right? We might still have fat voxels <laughs> and cover it, but yeah. the idea is progressive errors in geometry will result in pro progressive errors in the acoustics rather than giant errors suddenly that yeah. surprise you because of some details of the algorithm. Yeah. So, um, uh, related uh, question might be because um, uh, you, you mentioned sort of like holes in your 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 uh, voxelization. So the workflow we have here has got like an automatic probe placement mechanism. Is it possible for people to like sort of customize where the probes go and can they kind of like maybe they find a hole in the thing and they're like, actually, I need to move this probe here. And that kind of a thing. Is that something you'll be able to do? Related question about how to place probes where you want. Yeah. So there's two answers here. One is that we don't fundamentally need the nav mesh itself, right? We're just looking oh, yeah. where There's it can go. So you're totally free to make a plane or some geometry and tag it for navigation and make it invisible or something. But, and then we'll lay probes. Kyle's probe. about to show this yeah. slide if we want to flip to. Yeah, there was a whole bunch of questions related to like, because he used the nav mesh, but I think it was just because it was convenient, not necessarily because it was required. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But, you know, Kyle's going to show how to uh, place a pin probe. Um, I don't see it on the live stream, though. Like, we're not broadcasting the... Uh... Oh, yeah. yeah. We're on the Zoom call. We're all looking at Kyle right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's not on the... Can we flip back to, the, to Kyle's screen? Yeah, it, it flipped back. Okay. So, so we, we have an actor for that. So if you look up all of our acoustics actors, there's a acoustics pin probe actor. So this one basically allows you to put a pin probe, a probe wherever you want. So you just drag it into the scene. And if there's a corner or some area that didn't get hit by your nav mesh or by our probe placement algorithm, you can place a probe there. And you can place as many of these as you want. So we have both coarse grained. You can make planes with and tag for navigation. That's more coarse grained, but automated on that plane. And then you can also go custom. That's, here's the balcony yeah. where I missed a probe. Let me put it right in the middle of the balcony. Yeah. So the, the uh, by the way, I love the, that you get how nice it looks. You're like debugs <laughs> and you're like probes and it's like glowy. I just love it. Sorry. It's a thing. Unreal just good looks aesthetic. good. Yeah, no. <laughs> Unreal, Unreal. Unreal. On your live awesome stream. Like, look, at, look at the reflection in the glass. I'm like, we didn't I know it's, it's like beautiful. Yeah. I'm like, Jesus, look at that. <laughs> it could be a whole game. We'll take it. <laughs> uh, All right. So I think we covered a lot of stuff. Uh, in broad strokes. Um, we did. One thing I want to make sure we yeah. don't gloss over because um, we kind of brought it up before, but it was just if we can get some indication of like the size of the data that's generated after the bake. Um, I mean, yeah. I think oh, yeah. users see here like Lara's kind of a contained yeah. level. I don't know how many kilometers this is, but it's a certain size, but there's teams definitely thinking about building really open world spaces. They might need to do this across like humongous terrains. Um, right. So each yeah. of these, each of these probes uh, takes about, and Kyle should correct me, but about five minutes to bake each one. No, uh, the, these, these probes are quick for this level on course. I think oh, they're about course. a minute each. Right. So we have two resolutions. I think we should start there. We have yep. a course bake, which is bigger voxels, which are like half meter voxels, and then a fine bake. So iteration, you could use course bake, and then fine bake is sort of the production setting. 
and it takes substantially more because the voxel size is half, right? But for the fine bake, that's the numbers, like shipping sizes and stuff are impacted by that. So we'll cover that. Fine bake, each probe is a few minutes, five-ish, I'm thinking. Um, yeah. And, and then each probe's data size is about 40 KB, 40 kilobytes, right? So like overall for a project, how much did you guys add with Lyra to the, to the package size? So multiply by number of probes. So for Lyra, we have like 500 probes, right? That's the data file right there. Yeah. So um, we can look, see look. these two ACE files. They're about 20 meg each. Yeah, that's not too bad. 20 really megs bad. or 500 probes. And then you can also compute. It's really square footage, right? So you can also comp change our probe spacing, right? So in Lyra, I think we used our default 3.2 meters or something in open spaces. Yep. And as I said, in narrow hallways, it will automatically reduce, but that's what controls the, so you could increase it in a big terrain based world. You can make it six meters. People have driven it up to eight meters or something successfully in our experience. So you can go pretty high and course on these. So again, I, I guess my answer is a variant of your mileage will vary, but th there's the data. It's 40 kilobytes time, how many probes you get. And the spacing is typically three to eight meters in, in that range. So from that, basically, Particularly the navigable area you have where the player will go, you can compute. And what I'd say is that data size, even if it's a gigabyte, first of all, you can use include volumes to section it. So you break, basically break it into 100 MB sort of bite-sized chunks. Mm -hmm. And you, on top of that, you don't, we don't lead, load the whole ACE file. We actually have a fine-grained probe streamer in there. So we just really need the probes right next to the player. Each probe has data far out into the scene, right? So we just need at the minimal, just four, right? So we have like a 10-ish, 10, 15 megabyte fixed cost in RAM at runtime, plus however many, however many probes, like you're gonna have a very tight streaming region around the player if you want it. And right? while and that's debugging. very game dependent. Yeah. While you're debugging, you'll see the probes at runtime change colors based off if it's been streamed into the cache or if it has, is not in the cache yet. So the, from there, it becomes very game specific, right? So some game might be like, we have a static like streamer that gets in everything we need into RAM. And that would be like 100 megish, right? If yeah. you section up your scene with include volumes, or you could be like, yeah, it's some, some disk access is okay with us as the game goes, then it could be really small, like tens of MB RAM footprint. And we've shipped stuff in that whole range. Um, <clears throat> I should, uh, I can also, plug uh, UE audio, uh, all of our audio in 5.0 uh, streams, it, it, we use stream caching. You don't need, it's not, I wouldn't even say by default, it's, it's streaming. <laughs> uh, you can manually opt sounds in to load uh, inline uh, when the object loads, but pretty much all audio is streamed as well. So this kind of like stream from disk caching memory management is kind of uh, more optimized in 5.0 overall for audio. There's a question. We can do little clarifications, I guess. I don't know uh, if we have a strict stop time here. There's a question about RT60. Is it for the room or is it just inputting RT60 information? Um, and the answer is it's geometry driven. So you'll get the decay time from the room that you had and the materials you had, right? And you can get surprised sometimes. You make an empty room. It's small, but reasonably reflective. You'll get a long T60. And then you'd be like, why for a small room? And you just more, put more stuff in it and it'll, it's T60 will come down. So, so because there's more scattering. I actually have a question and, and maybe I'm, I'm silly for not knowing this, but the convolution reverb that you guys are using, that's actually a reverb tail computed from the acoustic simulation? Yes. Or is that something you guys tune? The, the, the IR one. is from, this, from the probes. Oh, no. So the filters are static. They're like, it's very parametric in its uh, in its intent done through convolutions, but it's just some nice sounding colorless reverberation I with see. the right decay time, and that's why it's super flexible, right? I see. You could even swap it based on your map or any granularity and say this is the sort of color I want in this scene. I see. And like it's it's a castle, it's very stone like, so you can choose your reverbs there and put in anything really. Uh, so that's part of uh, the. Uh, the way you guys have built this uh, plugin, it's it's an element of 
black magic slash art uh, that you guys can choose. Like these are the the uh, so you could actually go and get your own convolution from your own yep. space. Sorry, not convolution from your own IR from your own spaces, right. and then just and drop them in. Absolutely, and okay. that decoupling is very intentional. Like yeah. being able to it's use awesome. your spatializer, your IRs is very intentional. I I, would, I suspect if you were to do a, a analytical based IR. Uh, construction thing it wouldn't sound as good as just saying like hey put your uh, convolution that you want here <laughs> maybe because many of uh game spaces are acoustically defective <laughs> uh, that's a nice way to put it <laughs> hey, if you want to talk about indoor versus outdoor now that we're talking about these reverb oh, oh yeah yeah that's that's something we do um because our irs basically um the, the way we do analysis um we we don't extract this from simulation today, but drive it based basically on a measure of openness around the listener. So we, we produce a number between zero and one saying, how outdoors are you? And people have used that for all sorts of things beyond our anticipated use, but our immediate need was to make sure that uh, indoor reverb outdoors sounds horrible. So yes. it basically we also, not only do we cross fade across short, long, short, medium, long T60s, but we also cross fade ac across indoor and outdoor so if you go through a portal, uh, it will crossfade the reverb. The limitation with it is it's player-based, right? Yeah. Everything else is both source and listener-based, but this outdoorness aspect is today is still player-based, and we're working on driving it. You know, so you like can have everything. a sound outdoor, but you're inside. <laughs> yeah, that sounds Vice okay. Person. That sounds yeah. okay. Oh yeah, yeah, that's okay. It's the other way that. <laughs> Sources in a cathedral, you're really outdoors, not in a large yeah. hall, but outdoors start sounding outdoors, right? That's a lim known limitation we're working on. So actually that's um, for, for non-audio people, the, the, the reverb problem for in the smoke and mirrors approach for outdoors is really challenging. Like getting a good sounding parametric reverb for outdoor. Parametric, by the way, is, uh, is to, in contrast to an IR or impulse response based convolution. It's like data driven reverb versus like delay lines and sort of math reverb that's what we call them parametric reverbs so they're really hard and by the way parametric reverb is the way almost all games you reverbs and this convolution approach is sort of a newer way of doing reverbs in games so just background for for non-audio people um so outdoor reverb is really challenging so i can t i appreciate that you guys are actually handling it as a special case because it really should be um, and, and games that handle outdoor reverb really well, I'm very, always very impressed with. And it's and it's always something that I think the average non-audio person would never even notice because it's it outdoor reverb is very subtle. Well, it's you, like you don't you don't notice it until you don't do it. Yeah, and people are like, this is feels this is dry, bad. like weird. What the fuck? And, and well, yeah, <laughs> but uh, but it's a challenge, and I appreciate you guys trying to tackle that. And it's also connected to the echo problem. Outdoors, yes. the reverb itself is pretty yeah. weak and you have lots of echoes yes. coming in from stuff. So really, there's a, it's a complex problem in there that, that we, yeah, we definitely want to look at. And that I would say um, overall, going back to how fun it's been to collaborate with you, one of the things I really like working with you, Nikunj, um, even though you're a, like a PhD acoustical rocket science scientist, uh, you, you've been, and I think in general, your group uh, and your approach to all of this is very practical. It's, and I think um, in this space, it's the most exciting thing to see your willingness to <laughs> learn the lessons of, you know, game audio for the last 20 years. So I really do appreciate that sort of willingness to like compromise your perfect physical modeling of a space. <laughs> it's not a compromise. That's what I, I learned. I just the long path but yeah it, it's been fun for all of us frankly and like uh no steam everybody all of us have been yeah. listening a lot and learning a lot frankly and it yeah. takes a while <laughs> but we, we're learning there's some questions about absorption i can quickly answer two questions actually so about co absorption coefficients are they from real values yes they are and they are averaged over frequency because our solver does not support frequency dependent reflections yet. And that's again, something we're working on and making progress on. Um, so right now they're just averaged over frequency. So overall how absorptive, but yes, you can look it up in tables and books. That's how we came up with them. David Egan's book on architectural acoustics is where I found the values that we use. <laughs> so they're from a book. So um, there's a couple questions in the area area of like uh, you know C++ gameplay extensibility, 
blueprinting? How is this supported? One of the cool things about Project Acoustics is that the data is just a bucket of data that people can query. So do you want to talk about uh, maybe plan if you don't have them, but plans around just general support for gameplay, like a lot, like you mentioned AI uh, having access mm -hmm. to the data, but maybe uh, could you talk about a general blueprint API to query this acoustic data? Yeah, we haven't thought much about about how to expose that, but we're all for it. Like I, I spoke in, in um, response to your idea about putting this the parameters exposed in meta sounds. Yep. Because then it becomes easily queryable. But that's certainly a direction we can we can all think in. Yeah, my assumption is that whatever interface you have that we create in C, would be a C++ interface that would be something meta sounds would use, but also we could probably make and collaborate on a Blueprint API that's, that is just sort of like, give me where, you know, acoustic data at this point in space and then you could say right. the listener is at this point in space give me the acoustic data or whatever but have it sort of decouplable totally imaginable uh, yeah. we do our queries async today so there's yeah. some details there right what sort of you can do that kind of thing you'd have to have a delegate you know yeah give me the data and then like on data retrieved <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's like that business but it's pretty yeah. our stuff today also is pretty blueprintable Right, Kyle. I think we can. You can just access all those design params and stuff. Could you talk yeah. to it a bit? Um, design params. Yes, those are easily blueprintable. Um, all the stuff on the acoustic space actor that's accessible via blueprints. I think it's just the queries that we don't have set up yep. through blueprints. Cool. Well, and so, like, this is not the end of our collaboration. So, there, we'll, you know, out in the community. Please try it out. Give us feedback. Ping us on our you know, forums and social media, there's comments, we'll be paying attention. So if you run into issues or if you have ideas or anything like that, just let us know and we'll put that on our future roadmap for future collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, and I shared the link to the AI paper that Nikunj worked on for having non-player characters listen to this acoustics data. It's it's in the chat. So it started that. as an internal project actually. I shouldn't name the project, but yeah, with no we worked on that project and we realized actually yeah and then it gave us ideas about directional reverb and stuff it was a it was a fun paper but we tried to sort of really evaluate this idea can you drive game ai with with audio successfully and it, it works pretty decently you know it's a paper and it's test scenes and stuff so that grain of salt but so definitely. one thing uh, somebody asked a question and i think it's probably good for the audience if you're new to this space this idea of physics and audio which probably most of us are um the question was like are you all interested in essentially physical modeling but like simulating you know source generation and all that kind of stuff and i, I would say that project acoustics overall is not about source uh physical modeling but like how i drop a coin and it's simulating the sound of a coin and then kind of like physics way this is about uh, a simulation of essentially audio propagation um, in the in the deepest sense, which means reverb, which means moving through space. Which, so, and that, I would say that that is an orthogonal problem space to physical modeling. Um, however, you know, I think those two things could work well together in the future. Absolutely. And uh, and I and meta sounds. I want to plug meta sounds would be a good place for physical modeling experimentation. Absolutely, and. There, there's places of closest approach, like how people set up ambiences, like UE5 has water, right? You have water surfaces and stuff yep. when people are setting up ambiences. And that's that's a place where sound production propagation gets all, all sorts of mixed up because yep. it's just a river, right? It's not a point. Uh, yep. and the way you hear it sort of is a combination of little trickles coming in from yep. various places in the stream. Each propagated through the scene and mixing down into your head depending on where you're located so there's yep. very interesting spaces in between but yeah the, the yeah like at a broad level there's a very nice actually composability here yes. which is a great thing to have you have nice source production in meta sounds procedural propagate through the scene and at the end you spatialize with something and all these three blocks could be completely yep. different tailored algorithms for yourself that's a really good way to put it, com composability. Uh, by the way, the the, uh, the stream problem is classic in audio. That's another one is I call those distributed sound sources because we always model sound sources as point sources, but you have these things that, which have this sort of continuity and it's a hard, there's all kinds of smoke and mirrors approach to solve that. <laughs> so there, there, uh, there's a possibility, again, this is, we don't know exactly when we'll get to this stuff, but 
there's there's a possibility of saying in the editor this is where my stream is and yeah. then just baking out data for that stream saying depending on where you are that's more like light baking actually yeah. because the river won't move <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> water does but so you could actually bake out a very small in data most factor. games in mo- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so yeah you could bake out very small data in those cases saying this is how loud it is this, this is where you hear it from because depending on if it's a winding river where you are close or far yep. and and that that's also a possibility all right i'm going to look at some of the stuff that have rolled in since we started q and aing uh, because I, <laughs> there's, there's like t- literally 25 questions came in we could probably we run another one of these just for the rest of the yeah. <laughs> q and a if you um, get grace yeah why don't yeah. you give us uh, the final word on the last five yeah, minutes yeah absolutely well actually i want to close it off with one last question and then i'll take it home and yeah. close this out properly um, but we did have a few questions around, um, like, how does Project Acoustics fit into the pipeline for teams that are using um, external middleware? And I don't know why you would, by the way, use external middleware. I mean, yeah, it was pretty awesome. Didn't I put um, that so in, like, don't answer that question? <laughs> yeah, you totally did. But I'm all about <laughs> transparency and advocating for our users. So if there's any poor users out there, they're on, you know, FMOD wise. Um, could we just speak to kind of like, are they able to use this plugin? And what does that look like? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, we do have um, additional offerings that are not through the Unreal uh, Marketplace. Um, the intention of the Unreal Marketplace was to provide a solution that did not have any external dependencies. Um, that was kind of the explicit contract we had with with Epic, and we think it's you know a, a really good solid way to get into this space and learn how to. To do acoustic modeling and 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 you know get some good results uh, right out of the box, um, but we do have integration support for Unreal Plus Wise, and uh, on the Unity side we do have some some offerings there as well. Um, we don't have FMOD support at this point. Um, you know, largely is driven by what the needs are from our customers, and you know while FMOD comes up every once in a while, uh, overwhelmingly we get. A lot of uh, our customers using Wise, so that's kind of where we've been spending the majority of our attention. Um, in order to use the Unreal Plus Wise in um, for your for your app or for your title, if you want to get it onto platforms other than uh, kind of stock public platforms like Windows or um, Mac OS, then you'll you'll need to license the code because. You'll need a developer kit for, say, PlayStation or Switch, and uh, and so you'll need to be able to get the source for Project Acoustics and build it for those target platforms. So that's a whole different program that we have running, where you can get access to the source code um, and uh, you know go through your rep at uh, Microsoft to your gaming rep at Microsoft to uh, sign an additional license agreement to get access to the source. Um, and do other custom modifications that you need to um, for things that, that don't work for you or enhancements that you need um, for your specific title. Um, but but for the most part, the Unreal Marketplace offering is intended to be a standalone plugin, mixes and matches with other plugins in the Unreal ecosystem. Like we mentioned, uh, Google Resonance and other spatialization plugins are fully supported um, because we don't really care how you spatialize it. The um, the acoustic simulation is, you know, essentially a set of parameters that get applied um, to the rendering tech of your choice. So one, one thing to maybe related to this is that there's no fundamental platform dependency on Project Acoustics. So uh, if it, it, the, the biggest question is like, do you have access to the Sony SDK or the whatever is, or Nintendo, or so that that's just part of the uh, choose my words carefully difficulty yeah. of game dev um, uh, is just getting access to these SDKs, and so we can't distribute their that you know because those are all locked down. So you'd need to get those, and then so for indie devs, stick stick for you know, or even just for experiments for your students, Windows is probably the best. Do we actually? I don't know. Do we have uh, Mac support? Because uh, you, have you guys implemented Mac support? We do have the ability to do that, um, but we are not shipping it in our okay. you know, initial offering um, for, for Unreal Engine 5. That would be one that, that in, you could imagine having a Mac implementation. And uh, Linux, uh, you guys, I'm assuming you also haven't built for Linux. 
No, we have not built for Linux, although the big tools, um, when you run them in the cloud, are Linux-based. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our code is written completely in cross-platform yeah. way, so yeah, you yeah, can yeah. cross-compile to any other target that you want to. Um, yeah. There might be a little bit of adaptation work that's necessary uh, to adapt to that SDK, but uh, for the most yeah. part, like everything's written in. And, and needless to say, our audio engine works for all the platforms, so it would be, the integration wouldn't change, it's just like you gotta get the source and compile it for the platform. Right. And, and our plugin is a C++ plugin, so it does require you to have at least one C++ class in your project in order to build um, build this the uh, C++ plugin from, from our experience. Like you need at least one uh, blank C++ class in your project in order to kick in the compiler. Like a Blueprint's only uh, project. Yeah, you, yeah, you're talking about it's a C++ plugin, so you need a project which is... Yeah. Uh, not of just a pure blueprint project. I get it. Correct. Correct. Yep. Awesome. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone again for your time. I mean, that we didn't think we were going to use up the two hours, and I guess we managed to do it. Um, thank you so much, Tina, and the team behind the scenes who's been working fiercely to make a seamless experience. This live stream has been super fun for us joining. Um, huge thank you to the Microsoft team, like Noel, Nakunj, and Kyle. It's been a pleasure working with you. We look forward to continuing our work together. So uh, this is just a continuation of that piece. Um, and for everyone else who's on the stream, again, just a reminder, our plugin is available on the UE Marketplace now, or the Microsoft um, Project Acoustics plugin is in. Um, it's been up since May 17th, so feel free to go and download it and uh, leave us your feedback on that. Um, I did have something else to add, but Aaron had his hand up. So no, no, I was you. clapping. Oh. I was clapping. Oh, that was, was a clap. Trying. I'm sorry. I thought, yeah. I thought you wanted to insert something. Kate. No, 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 no. Sorry. But, uh, the last plug. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. I would just interrupt if I was going to interrupt. That was generous. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That works sorry. the other way you thought. Okay. But uh, thank you for the applause. But this won't be the last time you hear from us, particularly Aaron and I. We're really just getting yeah. started with kind of creating more forms like this to do live streams. We're working on a few really exciting things that we're really close to being able to announce and share. We can't do it quite yet, but it's coming soon. One of them we're particularly excited about because it marks the first time that we've ever done something of this kind or size for UE Audio. So stay tuned because very soon we're going to announce that. But thank you very much. Can we, can we uh, plug that we're going to be here again shortly, Tina? Yeah, please do. <laughs> I guess... So, so when we were hanging out for preparing for this, I was like, "Hey, Tino, if you have any openings, we got lots of stuff to talk about. Uh, you know, like we'll 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 be we'll be game for whatever open." And she's like, "I got an opening in two weeks." And are you serious? I was like, "Yes." So we'll be back. Um, so we're actually preparing for the actual topic now. I've got some questions out. Um, we have plenty of things to talk about, though. So uh, in two weeks, maybe you'll, we'll be able to tell you all about the thing that Grace uh, brought up. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. So yeah, for sure. That is a sneak peek. Make sure you come back in two weeks because we'll have these wonderful people back on and they'll have even more incredible information to give you. But I also wanted to take a second to thank all of you so much for coming on the stream today. It was genuinely incredible. I don't know if I can speak for everybody's behalf in chat, but I know at least for myself, it feels like I just took a master class. My head is so full of information and I'm going to have to go back and rewatch this video like four more times to make sure I've absorbed everything because it was just absolutely incredible. It's the coolest tech I've seen in a while. And it's such a game changer too. And I, I don't know if any of you got the chance to see the chat when you went through the actual demo, but I think we're all in agreement that that was so incredible. It was one of the best audio experiences ever, seriously, especially I had to make sure I had my headphones for this one because I was like, oh, got to get that that highest fidelity experience there. But Zoom Zoom does a great job on, on sharing audio. It's crazy. So plug for Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for taking the time to come on today. And also thank you, everybody who came to watch the show. This show would not be what it is without you coming, especially the Q&A segment. The amount of questions that we had for this show today was insane. So thank you so much for coming with your questions prepared. And we'll try and do our best to answer even more of them as well in the forums. We have a forum post that was the announcement for this. If we didn't get a chance to get to your question or if you have any more that have come up, 
please make sure you go and visit that forum, post your questions in there, and we'll do our best to answer some more of them for you because I know there's so much around this topic. So please don't be shy in making sure that you reach out. Um, but also with that, we post all of our streams in video format afterwards. So if you're like me and you need to make sure you come back to get all of this information, you can do that on both our Twitch channel and our YouTube channel. We'll have the VODs up on both of those platforms. Don't forget to keep up with us at Unreal Engine on all social media, as well as come say hi in our forums where you can get the latest news and also find all links associated with today's stream, including the marketplace link where you can get this incredible plugin. Make sure you do. Go get it. This is my personal reminder to you. Go get it, okay? <laughs> but with that, unless any of you have any closing statements, I think we can wrap it up there for today. And thank you so much. And I'm very excited to see you back again in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> yep. Thank, thank you, everybody. for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. Yes.